Oh man. Okay, so oh, as we're as we're done bumping, you know, the the vibe in the the green room was amazing. I love it. <laughs> uh, welcome back, everybody, to the Elastic Live user group. It is a regular uh, meetup that we do here live on YouTube, where we just hang out uh, and learn as much as we can about things in and around the elastic stack and being an elastician or just someone who plays around with elastic a lot. Um, I am <laughs> super excited. Yes. The, the countdown music is absolutely a bop. Um, this is week two of kind of the machine learning saga that we've started. I promise it will be better than episode two of most of the movies that, uh, or most of the series that people have, come to love or hate but back with me is ben trent ben what's up what's up so like better than raiders of the lost ark better than I mean... empire strikes back better than godfather <laughs> 2 better than star trek 2 bro I there's a thinking, lot of twos out there that are really i was good. thinking better than uh, attack of the clones but yeah oh, we can go well, yeah <laughs> so last week we talked a lot about kind of the idea of getting started with machine learning and then i was like Hey folks, come hang out with me on stream. And yeah, I have a three-year-old at home, so sometimes streams get canceled. Um, but I did work on some stuff. I have a lot of comments that maybe you can help me with, but I'm only going to try to do, I'm gonna knock all this out in like five minutes so we can get into the NLP uh, conversation. You think you got time for that? Definitely. All right, let's, let's go ahead and grab this. I'm going to Go ahead and share my screen here. Hopefully. There we go. All right. So uh, for those that don't know, the, the data set is, is pretty simple. Um, it is a look at uh, police calls in San Diego over the last five years or seven years now. So it's like 4 million records. Um, the data set itself is kind of interesting because of how they separate everything and i've i think i've talked about this before on the stream so if you're a regular listener then you might know if not well hey now you know but i wanted to look at the machine learning aspect of this to see if there was like any type of value that i could pull from just you know running this and just saying like hey look at this data turn this data and give me something i don't know uh, so I ran a couple of tests, going to say some of the tests were interesting. Uh, looking for anomalies was, was super fun. Uh, I will say the amount of data that you supply can definitely vary how long it takes for these to run. Also check your resources. Um, the first two were kind of really slow. But after a while, I was able to identify particular points uh, for police beats that had a little anomaly in what they would consider their standard type of calls. And the way that I set this up was I did, I'm trying to remember with Anomaly Explorer, you told me this yes, last week, this is unsupervised. Mm -hmm. or is unsupervised, okay. yeah. Yeah, so I did unsupervised learning. I said, look, influence it by the beat and the call type. And the call type is like the description of like, hey, there's someone throwing a party or, you know, hey, there's, you know, someone drunk at, at you know, the rock and at the, you know, I forgot Hard Rock Cafe or whatever. Um, so, yeah, I, I wanted to see, like, what are these anomalies that popped up? And I got a ton mm -hmm. of them, as you could see. One of the places I did not get was I tried to do forecasting to see, like, mm -hmm could you figure out any patterns for, you know, the future and then look and see how that matched up because there's like a week of new data that I haven't downloaded. Mm. Um, that said, my forecast just basically said, yeah, I got nothing. Um, yeah. So I'm not sure. I'm not sure why that happened, but so what guess. this, what I'm seeing here is you are doing a distinct count by priority. So what you're saying here. Mm -hmm. for your detector right there, if I see that correctly. Distinct count is kind of like the cardinality ag. What you're okay. saying is how many unique things are there in each bucket? 
So that may not be what you're looking for here. You probably just want regular old count uh, because you're worried about the volume of stuff, not the um, the number of kinds of stuff. Like an anomaly here would be there are typically within a bucket only 10 different priorities, no matter how many things are in there. Um, but in this bucket, there's 20 different priorities. Whoa. At that point, then that would be considered anomalous over time. So uh, count may be the thing you want there. Uh, that way you end up just getting the number of records per uh, bucket. And then it ends up, you end up being able to see patterns across your petition, your beats. Cause you're, cause you're wanting to see like which beat is acting strange in reference to its own history. Right. And in parallel, you probably care about which beat is acting strange when compared to all other beats. So those are two, those would be two separate analysis. Um, uh, one would be a count, not, but not with priority just a regular old count partition field beat. And then I think another one would be um, a population job probably on beat. It kind of depends on how many, uh, what's the cardinality of the beat set. I, I don't I don't know. We were talking about this data set before and uh, some of the data is kind of dirty, like some columns have like names that are flip-flopped and they seem like they're the exact same thing. Like one is like yeah. rock and roller two and the other one is two rock and roller. And it's like, that's the same thing. Yeah. To me. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, but I think that might give you some insights. Uh, when you would use this like distinct count kind of thing is if you have a, an example would be when you have a server or a host that, um, and you have network logs for it, and you know that it's only you're they're only going to connect to certain amount of uh, sibling hosts, and you can then do a unique count or a distinct count on how many things that that particular host connected to in an hour, and then you're like, okay, hold on, something's weird here. It didn't connect to enough hosts. So maybe there's something down, or it connected too much to too many. Uh, and you can do that like for a population, like is one server or one system uh, connecting too often to, to, to too many diverse hosts, then you can be like, this thing continues to flood my network. It's acting strange compared to what's considered normal for my system. So that would be an example of when you would want to use distinct count, maybe not this data set. That makes a lot of sense. And I, I think that's something that this is where like a lack of kind of understanding on how machine learning works and like using it in the system. It's, and and actually I'm glad we had this conversation these, these past two weeks, because one of the things that I did was speak at a C4ISR, which is a federal military symposium thing. And like one of the conversations was using machine learning and, um, a couple of people were like, oh, so I just push the button and walk away and then come back, you know, 10 minutes later and I've got data. And it's like, I, I mean, there, there's a little more to it than that. It, there, there's not really an easy button for this that you need to have some people who, one, have an understanding of the data, but also have an understanding of what's going on with the machine learning algorithms and, and not just applying one, but mm. looking at, you know, what what parameters do I really need to include? And also like what, you know, tests that I need to run and what do I need to have in my, my unsupervised learning, you know, yeah. setup. Yeah. So it is flexible and you don't have to be like a data wrangler to, to fully grok it, but knowing all your options and the, the way I sort of approach these sorts of problems is I ask what question am I trying to answer? Um, what question am I trying to answer? It's like, okay, I'm trying to answer uh, what caused the failure or I'm trying to catch when a failure occurs or I'm trying to find strange behavior when it comes to these metrics. And then once you have those questions, you can start building a system around that. Uh, but something that can help is if you scroll up and go to data visualizer, 
Okay. Uh, select your uh, police data index pattern. Uh, Is it that PD calls? Uh, yep, just saw it. And so okay. what this has given you is the st statistics around like how often things occur and uh, can also be split up by time. And sometimes this can help you sort of get a bird's eye view. Uh, sneak peek in version eight or adding this sort of visualization into Discover out of the box. So um, those who are using Discover or like Discover, uh, you can end up getting like these high level aggregated views to see like what the distribution is of terms and of values over time uh, for your data. And this can help you select the things that you, that are like, okay, I want, I want this to be one of my influencers or the thing I'm gonna partition my data on and that kind of stuff. If you don't um, quite know what questions you're trying to ask yet. Awesome. All right. so. We're, we're 10 minutes in. I'm not going to bore everybody with what I'm doing. But I, I will say I want to come back and revisit this with you at some point. And uh, maybe we can hash out like, hey, we learned a thing from this. So thank you for that. But sure. uh, as we were talking, uh, last week was machine learning kind of the primer. This week is... NLP, natural language processing, uh, sentiment analysis is the one thing that I always hear mm. around NLP. Um, and the only time I think I've ever used that in the wild is with Twitter, which is like, yeah. hey, give me give me only the stuff that's not going to make me depressed. Yeah. Um, so let's let's start in by learning a little bit more about natural language processing and uh, or parsing. Sorry. And we can go into kind of the different ways it can be used. Yeah, so natural language processing. So you're right, it's the processing part. Oh my God, see, you're exactly. right. Acronyms. You're right, Jay, don't second guess yourself. <laughs> you know a lot, you're a smart guy. Uh, so uh, NLP is effectively machines trying to understand uh, how people write text and get information out of it. Um, it's... People write text in horrible, messy, gross ways, and a lot of it doesn't make sense. So pre-2000, probably pre-2010, I think, almost all of NLP was rule-based, meaning somebody typed up statistical distributions manually, built uh, rules to indicate, is this a verb, a noun, uh, what this person is trying to say, is it near these words? And these were done by a human. Uh, and I think around 2010, uh, Google released this model called BERT, which completely changed the landscape. Uh, BERT um, is a deep neural network and it's considered a, and it, and it is built around this concept of attention. So a given token um, what the neural network isn't necessarily concerned just with that one token, but it's concerned about the token and its greater context. So it has this sparse attention to what's going around in the greater context. And Google trained this model on effectively all of Wikipedia. Uh, and it used, and it used a new sort of tokenization mechanism. So what I mean by that is, you can't just take a blob, a paragraph, and give it to a neural network. You have to somehow transport. Um, yes, and there's some really great talks. There's this YouTube talk that's called um, Attention's All You Need. And it's a real great deep dive uh, with pretty graphs and everything. Uh, but um, you have to transform these uh, words into numbers and BERT uses a word piece uh, tokenizer. So it'll tokenize the words with some different rules. And so you end up getting individual words and then those words are to uh, tokenized even farther and split into pieces. 
And all of this is based off of a vocabulary or a dictionary that Bert was trained with. And it's like 20,000, 30,000 or something like that. It's a fairly large dictionary. And since it's word pieced, it doesn't have to have every word in the English language, but it has a lot of the pieces that make up all the words. And so it can end up seeing new words uh, that weren't necessarily in like the, like the Webster's dictionary and not kind of barf and it could give you decent results. So they trained it on Wikipedia. And then the other amazing piece of technology that was built out of this is transfer learning. So I'm, re I'm really sad you didn't say it was Ernie, but like, yeah, Ernie, like, right. Uh, <laughs> there's Bert, there's Bart, there's big bird. There's, I don't think there's a, there might be an Ernie, I only know about Bert Bart. Bart is Facebook's, I think. Uh, uh, Big Bird was another Google one that came out later. And then there's other ones that are GPT. Like we, we know about GPT from the news, GPT two and three. Yeah. And those use a separate tokenizer, but they also like the idea is attention. Um, but they just kind of boost up the parameters that they're given to the, uh, to the neural network. So they train this thing on Wikipedia. It, uh, it can then be specialized. So they trained it. Basically, they gave it a sentence and then they took out a word. They took out a word from the sentence and then the model guessed what the word should be in the sentence. And they did this billions of times until it finally guessed correctly on a lot, like 90, 98, 99. Uh, percentile correct when it comes to guesses. And then now you have this mask fill idea. So now you you can give this model a, like uh, blank is the capital of France and it'll say Paris, which is like kind of magical. Like you, you, you didn't tell it that it learned that from the data. Uh, so it was a sup it's a supervised learning model because there was something that it was targeting, which was filling these words in. But with transfer learning, you can now make this thing do pretty much anything in LP. Um, and so with version eight of the Elastic Stack, we will support PyTorch BERT models inside of Elasticsearch. At ingest time, you can uh, send a document through and create a uh, and embedding, get your emotions or your sentiment analysis, do named entity recognition, um, do any sort of custom text classification and zero shot classification. And this is all sort of there. So if I can share my screen, I'd like to yeah. show some of this. Some of, it's, some of it's funny because it is a machine. It's not a person. So some of the things <laughs> it comes up with are like, Okay, but then it's like scary, accurate other times that are like, okay, this is incredible. All right. While, see, while you're coming screen. up with that, do you know like what was what was the underlying, not technology, because obviously we've just been talking about this whole time, but like in, in terms of getting it into the elastic stack and bringing it to like on ingest. Cause in my mind, I keep, I keep thinking like runtime fields make the world go round. Like the fact yeah. that you can, you can say like, I can load data in and as I'm loading the data or as I'm getting what I need, just, you know, do all this other stuff with it and then don't worry about it any other time. And I feel like this is where yeah. like tools like that are super powerful, but then also like that on ingestion learning. So yeah. When I ingest, do a thing, store the results. That way you don't have to do it every time, which is kind of like a runtime fill, but kind of a run once on ingest. Yeah. So that's like, that's, that's phase two. That's kind of the idea is that we want to be able to do this at search time. Um, one of the problems is, is that these neural networks are large. Yeah. Um, Elasticsearch is uh, a Java program. Uh Java is not good at neural networks. It has to call out to C. And so that's what we're doing. We're calling out to C++. We're interacting with PyTorch directly. And it's experimental. So we're wanting to get one step ahead, step by step. 
And so we had to reduce our range here so we can actually, you know, one of our, one of the things at Elastic is uh, simple progress over perfection. Like we just want to push down, uh, go in the right direction and making sure we can uh, deliver something incrementally. And so at ingest time, that's just the initial thing. And I can show you sort of how it works and only PyTorch. Uh, specifically Torch Script, we have something in Eland that allows you to upload this, uh, upload models from Hugging Face uh, directly. So let's let's talk about that real quick. So this is Hugging Face. Hugging Face is an incredibly small and scrappy team that have built. Your screen. Am I not sharing my screen? Let's. Uh, there we go. Oh, there we are. Was <laughs> there I? There we are. Oh, if I click the thing. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Uh, all right. So. <laughs> Let me, okay, here we go. So here we are at Hugging Face and this is their website and they have a uh, model uh, hub where you can upload a neural network model and you can share it with the world. And so we have a tool set for you to take a PyTorch model and specifically uh, BERT model. We only support BERT tokenizations right now. We're wanting to support more. We're wanting to support Roberta. We're wanting to support um, some, some uh, Microsoft has a proprietary one that's slightly different from BERT. And we're wanting to do all that, but we want to you know take it one step at a time. So if we can look here, I can go to token classification, which is this like named entity recognition. And we actually have two models that we fine-tuned ourselves and uploaded here. Um, and we have Eland set up to where in version eight, you can tell it, you can click this model, copy paste this section, basically just the ID. Now I have the ID, you paste it, uh, in this script and you just run this script. So you tell it this hub model ID. Uh, I'm going to send it to this Elasticsearch URL with my creds and I want it for this specific task. So for this model, it would be for named entity recognition and it would end up being, uh, you would just type in NER and it would upload and put the model in your cluster and then you can start a deployment with it and it'll run on machine learning nodes and then you can use it. And so you could do this not just for uh, token classification things. So let me go back here. We can do regular old text classification, which is like your sentiment analysis uh, or uh, zero shot classification, which I can show, which effectively is the model doesn't have labels, which is kind of magic. Like you think classification, I'm going to, label 30 different things. No, you just give it whatever labels you want. And it says, what are the likelihoods of these labels? Um, and uh, we also have uh, embeddings and what else? I can actually, I have a handful of here. So we got zero shot, text classification, NER and embeddings are the ones that I'm gonna talk about. We, you can also just do the regular old mask fill. Um, so, I have some models here I've already uploaded. Uh, here's one, which is uh, giving me the emotion, sadness, joy, love, anger, fear, and surprise. So I'm, I have that model here. I have, uh, this is regular old positive or negative sentiment analysis. Here is uh, named entity recognition. Uh, we use inside outside um, tagging for tokens. If you don't know what that means, don't worry about it. Uh, we're planning on supporting more. And uh, here is an embedding one. And this one is trained off of the MS Marco question and answer data set, which is pretty magical. And I'll show you some stuff here that kind of surprised me that it worked. And, uh, and here is one, and here's the zero shot. And this is a really efficient and small model that was built for mobile and quantized for mobile, but we can run here in the servers and, effic and it efficiently gives us answers.
Real quick, we have a question from chat. Um, yeah. Brian Wood asks, is any of this available in the alphas or the betas of 8.0? So yes, beta one has this. Alpha has some of it, but it didn't. It wasn't fully featured. Um, I think there were some things we were missing in alpha, but in beta one, yes, it's available. Uh, beta two, uh, there will be bug fixes and performance improvements. Um, there are some deployment settings that we didn't have that we wanted uh, that have to do with parallelization across CPU cores and faster inference and throughput. And that'll be in beta two. Uh, and of course, all the bugs that anybody like Brian Wood finds uh, will end up fixing. Uh, and this is experimental. So uh, it, we're, this is, we, our plan is to make this a turnkey solution and make it better and better and better and make it faster, more customizable and everything. So we're just starting slow and then we'll see where we go. So I have these models here. Um, I We have a data set of Yelp uh, reviews that was uh, used for training different models. And they have a test and set, a test set and a train set for, is this a positive review or a negative review? And so what I wanted to do is without any fine tuning, put this through a uh, emotion da motion detector data set. And uh, I'll show you what the data looks like. So I'll do a size one. And I'm looking at my predicted emotions and then I'm seeing the top three hits uh, within those predicted emotions. All right, so let's see here. So here's my. Uh, this is what one of the. This is what the data looks like. So we have a review. We have uh, my prediction here, which is joy. Obviously, it got this one wrong. Uh, there's probably because it's sarcasm. Uh, the model is not great at sarcasm. Uh, if it was fine tuned on Twitter or Reddit, it probably would get sarcasm a lot better. Uh, but here it's predicting. So this is a prediction of joy. Uh, and specifically I can show you what this ingest pipeline looks like. Uh, this is all the pipeline looks like I referencing my model and I'm saying, the input field text field, which is what it is for all of these models, uh, is actually the review field. So I'm saying take the review field, it's actually the text field, put it through this model and put everything in um, and put everything in the document. So let me run this again and sh let's look at some of the results we got. And I just ran this today. So, and I haven't like quality checked these results. So, I mean, we're doing it live. So this is for joy. Um, let's see here. We have this one, which is obviously not joyous, uh, but for some reason, it's very confident that this is joy. All right, this model may not be good at detecting sarcasm, uh, but this one here, we have my wife and I enjoy sushi. Of all the sushi restaurants in the Urbana area, this is our favorite. And yeah, joyous. All right, fantastic. Let's see here. Um, here's another joy, another sushi restaurant. Uh, and it has a one sentiment so that people seem to like it. Uh, free miso soup. Okay. This actually sounds like a really great place. Uh, I want some sushi now. All right. Let's look at some anger here. Uh, small TVs, no draft beer, and took 45 minutes to get our food placed. They do, do, do sound angry. <laughs> Uh, how about this one? Definitely not good service. Didn't ask if we needed shoe rentals. Didn't explain anything. I hope this is for a bowling alley. Not like I, I was going to ask. <laughs> this is a this is a weird sushi place. <laughs> like sushi bowl, I guess. No. Uh, yeah. 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 All right. Let's see. Let's go. Let's see. Sadness. If you're already a regular here, congratulations. You're getting great surface. If they don't recognize you, recognize you. Good luck. It's not just my party. It's throughout the bar. That is sad. Uh, don't go to the Blue Diamond location. Bland and undercooked. Sad. Let's see about some love here. Ah, this one probably has some sarcasm in it. And uh, we didn't tokenize all of this. We only took 
we only take the first 512 tokens and then we truncate the rest. Mm -hmm. So we're working on making that better. There's a way to handle that where you kind of scroll across the data and um, so you can end up having really large chunks of uh, text like this, but we don't quite have that yet. And that won't be in the initial release. That's a thing that we want to have early on in eight. Um, let's see here. And let's look at one more. Let's look at surprise. I was surprisingly impressed. Su sushi again, positive sentiment. All right, man, we're just learning that. Uh, uh oh, chicken teriyaki. This might be another sushi place. You should have got the sushi, man. All right, let's see if there's any fear. I don't see how there could be any fear, but um, the employee helped us and was clueless. I will never come back to Payway. Lackluster food. So it's not very confident in its prediction of fear here. You can see it's fairly low. It probably beat out one of the other negative emotions, um, just barely, except for this one. This one seems very fearful. Um I don't really see how this is fearful, but given the context that it learned from, I could see. That but, could also be a um, just kind of the trend of like, how do you how do you translate fear into a Yelp review? Unless it was like, yeah. I I ate this and a rat came across the floor. Like exactly. I, I, so it's like maybe I, like we were talking about before with you know the machine learning side having the right models for mm -hmm. the type of you know, information that you have. Yeah. And that's kind of the beauty of transfer learning. What I could have done if I had time was taken, was taking uh BERT itself, the BERT base, and then retraining it on uh, data sets that, and I could fine tune it based off of Yelp and I could have some labeled data set um, and I would fine tune the model and it wouldn't take nearly as long to train and it would be specifically built for this scenario. And that's kind of the beauty of this transfer learning. So this is this is regular text classification. I had five labels. My Windows mirrored, sorry. I had five labels uh, for, the emo for different emotions. And now we can do zero shot classification as well. So if I get a bad sentiment and I want to see, was it my service? Was it food? Was it wait time? What's another one? You said rats is another one. What would be another label for Yelp? Um, hipster? I don't know. Uh, so let's look here. And wait time is the worst one here. Food rats is really high up there. Where is it getting rats? All right. Uh, but underwhelmed both times. The glass stayed empty. Food was decent, but the portions were small. Hmm. What's another one here? Let's look. How about let's do let's do a positive one, an actual positive one. My wife and I enjoy sushi. Is it the food, the service, or the rats? Okay, good. There's no rats here. Uh, people love the food, and that's the, that's what it's labeling. This is a food focused thing and good on service, and it seems to be fairly hipster. Uh, so this seems like my kind of restaurant, we'll see. But this is zero shot classification. So like I could give it any text and say, emergency, cell phone died, I need help immediately. And we could say technology, History, I don't know what what else. Um, urgency. You can, you can keep rats in. Apparently, that's the rats. Theme of <laughs> we'll keep rats in here, and uh, we could say that it's a very urgent thing. And uh, for some reason, history is here, probably because of the died part. <laughs> um, and I can switch it here from multi-label to false to say that it's only one specific true label and i'm guessing urgency would be the specific true label here um and so this is a thing that's urgent and you can do um and this is zero shot and so i never trained it on these labels and zero shot's pretty magical it's a specialized version of that 
you know, I was saying how Bert was trained to predict the word in the blank space. Zero shot is a specialization of that where the label is put in the blank space and you can end up getting some really interesting results. Use this to explore your data initially and then you can fine tune it. A lot of people use zero shot for like automatic categorization and tagging of news articles, mm -hmm. of tweets, uh, and blogs and this kind of stuff. And you can ingest this, it would end up having this predicted value and you could ingest the top classes if you wished and they would all be searchable. Okay, all right, that's enough. We spent 15 minutes on that. Yeah, uh, here's NER. We have a question coming in for NER, so I'm going to I'm gonna wait and see if you answer it. And if you don't answer it, then I'll bring it back up. Okay. Here's NER. Here's, a, here's an example. I, Benjamin Trent, I am a person, and this is the entity. I'm a software engineer at Elastic, which is an organization. I live in South Carolina, which is a location. Uh, and here is our entities, and all of this can be indexed. So we'll, you can, you'll, we'll index these entities, um, the type that they are, our probability and the token positions. Uh, but this particular format looks weird, right? This is a weird looking format. And this pairs up exactly with our annotated text format. It's like, okay, annotated text, I've never heard of that. Well, it's a plugin that we've had for a long time and it allows for stuff like this. So here I have a search uh, with this, uh, yeah, Brian's right. Uh, Here's this search, uh, and I'm just doing a regular text match thing. So this means the text is analyzed, and I'm doing an inverse search and scoring based on these tokens, uh, does all the Lucene stuff, and here. So I end up getting two hits. The first one is Elastic has headquarters in Mountain View, California. Okay, yeah, sure, Mountain View, California. And then here, it's sadly, the headquarters does not, in fact, have a Mountain View. This really shouldn't have been a hit. I was looking for Mountain View capital up and I don't care about it having a Mountain View. I would want, I want the place Mountain View. So what we can do here is you can do a term filter for this particular term against the annotated text field. And since I have it in a filter, it's not scored. It's just going to filter to that term and I only get one hit and it's the place that has Mountain View. Now, this may not impress you if you don't know how text searching works, uh, but stuff like this is pretty awesome because what you get now is you can have these locations and organizations that live as terms so that you can boost things as terms and have automatic extraction of organizations places, persons, and we have one that is just miscellaneous that kind of captures other terms. So now uh, you can find, you can have this location just from some text. Uh, so you don't have to worry about fancy term matching and all of that. And this is, this particular model is a specialization that we have that we built off of a specific data set and we fine tuned it on the CONLL03 data set. And this one is cased, which means it's case sensitive. Okay. And uh, if you're curious, get NER. Uh, let's see here. Predicted value. I had, I manually created this index and I made predicted value annotated text. And a lot of this is customizable. You can tell the ingest pipeline to write values in different places and different kinds and stuff like that. But uh, so I set this up to be an annotated text. And what we're wa we're wanting to have more named entity support in the future, um, where it's not just persons and places. Uh, you could end up having more fine tuned and more diverse entities, or you just provide your own, and you have your own. A bespoke entity set that your group has created um, and that would be indexed. Any more, any questions around NER or uh, zero shot and emotion stuff before I jump onto embedding, 
which uses two new technologies that are coming out in version eight. Doesn't look like it. Let's uh, let's keep running. All right. So uh, Les Mis is now uh, effectively open source. Um, the copyright has fallen out and Les Mis is now free on the internet. So it's a really favorite data set of ours um, for text analysis. And here I have the MS Marco, which is fine-tuned on question and answer, though not question and answer for Les Mis. So some of the answers we may get may be a little bit weird. But uh, I have a pipeline that writes to uh, a dense vector with the 384 dimensions. I, I knew ahead of time what the dimension output dimensional output is for my embedding. And this is semantic embedding uh, for text. Uh, so this is a this is like the search of the future. It's able to there's no need for like slops or um, synonyms or trying to figure out context in the search. It sort of kind of does that for you. Uh, the similarity I'm using here is L2 norm. There's a handful of other similarities that we will support for dense vector in version eight. Uh, and I'm saying it's an indexed value that I'm going to search against. All right. And this is using like brand new uh, approximate nearest neighbors built in Lucene for Lucene 9 coming out in version 8. All right. And this is still like a work in progress, so much so that it's that you can see the endpoint I'm using isn't even the regular search endpoint. Like this is like cutting edge stuff that uh, we want people to experiment with. Yeah, this is not the final version. Uh, we're wanting to do all kinds of stuff like adding the. It's the hierarchical, small world algorithm stuff. It's it's pretty in depth, um, but yes. So this is the the data set. This is sort of what the data looks like. This is my embedding, which to a person means absolutely nothing. This is garbage. Like, how do you get from at home? Mario slowly opened his eyes and at a glance, blah blah blah. blah you get this right? doesn't make any sense to us. But what this does do is like, all right, I'm going to embed my question here with my infer endpoint. Which prisoner number was uh, Jean Valjean? All right. All right. Here's my predicted value. I'm going to take this sucker, copy it. I'm going to put it here in my cane and search. I'm saying look against uh, my predicted value, which is an embedding. Um, I want, I only care about the paragraph and the line coming back. I don't want to get my, I don't want to get the vectors coming back. I'm looking at the top five and the num candidates that I look at for, uh, each shard is going to be 10. Uh, and hit number two, the man was committed under nine name number 9,430 and his name was Jean Valjean. Are you kidding me? Like, I don't know, like to me, this gives me like goosebumps. Like I have just two numbers and I gave it a number and I gave it a question. And then the number two hit was my answer. Like I did zero fine tuning. I did nothing. I literally made two API calls and I'm getting the answer that I want, which is like for search engineers, uh, it's like a nightmare to try to get a Q and A data set together and bubble up the answers that we want. Um, let me see, I can get some different, if anybody has any questions about Les Mis, uh, I'll happily ask them. Uh, but this is uh, this is effectively, this is all of my demo is uh, like, um, I don't really know all the characters. So let me see, what was the one like Eponine? Didn't she love this dude who was a dirt bag? It, it's been so long at this point. Right? Um, yeah. <laughs> How about does Marius hate Gilnormand? We we do have another question in the chat. Let's see after you uh, figure this out. Could it work with any dense vector embedding, including images? The answer is uh, yes, but we don't really have a way to tokenize the images. Like if you could... Um, I'm not sure how we could represent the images inside of Elasticsearch. 
I know that in at Elastic, we have a thing called space time. And some engineers have like looked at playing around with this to see what we could do with images. So, all right, does Marius hate Gilmorand or whatever? My French is atrocious. Um, furious and ashamed. Um, he loved Marius. Oh, whoa. Marius would leave him in a few moments. A harsh reception. Man, we're getting a lot of drama. Man, I, I honestly, I didn't know how much drama was in Les Mis until I started doing these demos and thinking about it. It's like, it's like days of our lives, but French. Like, it's like, <laughs> it's pretty intense. <laughs> um, but yes, Brian, this could work with images and it could work with any embedding. Um, and it would have to be for it to work in stack. At, if you are saying you want to have documents that come in and you want them to be embedded uh, with the contents of the documents, the image would have to be translated to some sort of textual format uh, because we don't really have a way to have um, blobs outside of just JSON. It's all a RESTful interface. Um, but you could index uh, all of these vectors uh, yourself. So you could do the uh, vectorization yourself. Um, or have some sort of representation that you can use here. I'm not 100% sure if there is such a representation for images. There probably is. Um, and then you can do this cane and search against your image uh, field and with whatever your query vector is. But yeah. P hashes. Uh, Eddie? Sounds like you know more about that than me. <laughs> there you go. I haven't I haven't looked at image embedding. Uh, my head's been in the NLP space for a while. But you could probably hash the pixels, if that's what you're saying, a hash representation of the pixels, and then feed that through um, some sort of... Uh, you could either make those hashes themselves the vector or feed that through a model that uh, gives you like contextual awareness of what hashes are near each other and what do they mean. Um, uh, but yeah, yeah, you could totally do something like that at index time. So let's, or I guess there's yeah, another a convolutional one. neural network um, would get to a similar thing for extracting some features. Uh, because you are you're like labeling things in the image potentially, uh, yeah, yeah, similar kind of idea. Uh, right now, the PyTorch stuff we only support is um, NLP based. So for PyTorch in the stack, we're focusing on BERT tokenization at NLP. But one of the hardest things was getting like the PyTorch library all hooked up and built and running on cloud and making sure that we can get to it reliably and do all of this and adding particular tasks. So that hurdle was the first thing. And then now we're looking for what's next. So more different types of NLP models using inference at different times uh, and just more PyTorch support. Like what else could we support within PyTorch? And it could be some of these more uh, like different types of neural networks and inference tasks for sure. So I, I have a, a question going back to kind of the, how do we get this data in? Um, I remember mm -hmm. you, you mentioned like you go to Hugging Face, you find a model that works and then you mm -hmm. use Elon to load stuff in. Is is that going to be the only way to do this or no. is there? Okay. No. So what you can do is uh, you can take a look at the Elon code yourself. It's all open source. Uh, so for like Brian Wood's question, can this be done air gapped? So if you have a model, like a PyTorch script model, that's a BERT model, um, and you want to upload it to Elasticsearch, you can use, you can kind of slice and dice in Elon. We don't have anything yet. We're wanting to release like documentation and stuff for how you could take your own PyTorch model, like it's pickled or something, and you read it into Elon 
you use our little wrappers that we have in Elon and you output it as a torch script in like a bin file. And then you put that on your thumb drive, put that on another computer or do this all within the same network and then use Elon to slice and upload that like dot bin file or in that temp directory. And so, yes, it's something that you can do air gapped. Um, and guessing by some of the questions from Brian, he's smart enough to to look into Elon and dig into it and get it done. But this is some of the content that we're wanting to get out there. We've been busy writing it. So now during the beta releases and everything like that, we're working on the different workflows and how we can describe these. Um, uh, Tomas says, did I understand it right earlier? Do you have pre-trained models for locations? Can you tag data in the text? I, I live in Washington. Do you, uh, I live in Washington here in DC. Oh, 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 oh. So no. So named entity recognition is only looking at tagged uh, tokens within the text. It doesn't have a larger context of, all right, that token refers to this uh, geolocation. Uh, but that's something that can totally be done in PyTorch. Uh, and there's probably models that do that. Uh, but that's not a thing that will be out of the box uh, in version 8. Um, I, I and feel the, like I want to uh, talk to Tomas about that and learn more about what, what he's trying to do with this because I've, I've had my own demo where, for those that don't know, the University of Mississippi happens to be in university the city mississippi the state uh which has ruined many of my search searches in the past because anytime i type in university like it's always oh did you mean the university of mississippi and i was like whoever did that they're they were thinking towards the future but <laughs> right. I, I would love to learn more about doing doing just this very thing yeah so it it will like tag things differently like if you say uh, President Washington lived in Washington, Indiana. It will say Washington is a person and Washington, Indiana is a location, but it won't say um, this is the geolocation of Washington, D.C. versus Washington, Indiana. Um, those would be different things. But yeah, it, it, it's pretty good at tagging. Um, and the model can be fine tuned, like if you have different data sets. And there are various NER data sets and text classification data sets that are fine tuned for very specific needs that can answer these questions. And if it uses a BERT tokenizer and is PyTorch, uh, we very likely support it in version eight. So those are our only two restrictions. And that sounds fairly restrictive, but that's a class of like thousands of models. Um, and it's uh, what a lot of people have been using for a long time. Uh, we were wanting, as I said, we we're wanting to add more support for different types of, probably be PyTorch for a while, but we want to add different tokenizers and different neural networks and uh, flavors on that. Very awesome. Well, um, thank you, Brian, for, for hanging out. Um, I would definitely want to throw this up because I feel like I haven't thanked uh, Ben enough for coming here and, and explaining this because uh I am I'm still very new to the idea of using machine learning and, and NLP. Um, that said, let's begin to wrap this up. And uh, as always, I do this with saying this is always an AMA. Thank you so much for bringing in your questions. Uh, this event would be much shorter uh, if there weren't any. But if you have other questions or if you're playing around with the beta and you know you have future questions, Discuss.elastic.co is the place to talk about those. Um, ben, I we we told everybody to come tell you hi in the community Slack. Did anyone uh, take me up on that offer? Uh, yes, somebody did. Uh, awesome. They gave me a shout out, and uh, it was great. So come to the community Slack inside of the in the machine learning channel, um, and we can sort of talk back and forth and workshop a thing. And it may be that our conversation gets so deep that the conversation then gets transported into discuss so that posterity can have it in the future. Um, 
So, but the difficult thing sometimes is like, you don't even know what kind of question to ask yet. You're still exploring. And the Slack is really good at that to figure that out. Yeah. I, I've learned that. I mean, luckily I get to cheat and just message you directly and go, Hey Ben, like I broke a thing. Can you explain? Um, but uh, as we mentioned, what we kind of showed was a sneak peek into what's happening. Um, as with all sneak peeks and betas, we have to remember not a final version. Um, if you're watching this in the future when 8.0 is out, hopefully I will be able to convince Ben to come back on and we can do some demos of what the final version looks like. Uh, but if you're watching this one, something may have changed. And if it is, we are sorry, but uh, that's what we get for playing with betas. Yeah. But, uh, oh man, there's so much more machine learning stuff to talk about. Like we didn't even talk about outlier detection and chaining together unsupervised and supervised learning. We didn't get to talk about automatic machine language, machine text categorization as an ag and for anomaly detection. We didn't talk about correlation analysis and all this stuff. So there's all kinds of stuff that's machine learning adjacent. Um, 8.0 win. Yes, early 2022. Uh, if the cricks don't rise, right? Uh, that's what right. will happen. Awesome. Well, that's going to wrap it up for this week. Right now, we currently don't have a topic uh, for next week's live stream. So you may just be hanging out here with me. And uh, if you have a topic, if you have something that you're interested in or that you want to learn more about, um, it can be more machine learning. I don't know if Ben will be able to join us, but I might be able to to hit him up in the the secret Slack DM, you know, privileges and and get some answers. Or if you have any topic around the Elastic Stack, around working with or for Elastic, more than happy to jump on. Um, I can't reveal why we're absolutely having another live stream next week because we're going to be announcing something uh, on the community side. Uh, so if you're in the community, you might want to might want to come visit us next week and learn more about that. But that's going to do it for this week. Uh, ben, once again, thank you so much for being an awesome guest. Um, chat, thank you for being an awesome chat. I think this is the most engagement we've had uh, in a few. So awesome, everyone. Have a great rest of the day.